Jeff, it's great to see you, man. Thanks for joining us. The infamous and illustrious Jeff Abbott joining us live at Rebels of the Heart. Welcome. The pleasure is mine, and thank you for the overly kind introduction. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here in the studio and for us to have a conversation. I mean, we've gotten to know each other a bit, but really just want to highlight your story, your work, all the things that you're doing in the tech space, supporting entrepreneurs, supporting businesses, and your own personal journey as an entrepreneur. So why don't we start there and just tell us a little bit about you and Fantastic. what brought you back to Phoenix? So I, well, I was in Phoenix from 2012 to 2017. So for about five years before that, uh, I was three years in Tucson. I came out to Tucson because my parents had retired here in 1991, the same year that I went to Thunderbird. So I'm originally from Chicago, you know, grew up in the city, um, went to work in banking, really had an international bug. So I came out to Thunderbird and, and that's really where my journey with Arizona got started. So um, after that, I had about a 15 year corporate career. Uh, because of the Thunderbird connection, I was able to get to London and Mexico and Brazil and many other places. Um, and one of the stops along the way that I would say triggered my interest in technology entrepreneurship was I had the chance to run um, the very first e-commerce e-business, today would be called Digital Transformation Department at yeah. General Electric Appliances in Latin America. So among other things, we built the first websites and built the first e-commerce stores and online customer service. And you know, there was some back end to that, like implementing big systems and some strategy. Yeah. Um, but the coolest thing we did was build and scale the largest online appliance store in Latin America, which is still out there today. And Amazing. when I think back on it, many of the things that we did fit into this split scaling playbook that we're now working with and, and it all makes more sense. Amazing. Well, talk to us about blitz scaling. Share with us what you're working on now and we'll connect the dots along the way here. Sure. Well, blitz scaling is a, a book written by my partner, Chris Ye and his co-author, Reed Hoffman. Reed, the illustrious and uh, incredibly well-known um, entrepreneur who was first a founding board member of PayPal and then the co-founder of LinkedIn, the first investor along with Peter Thiel at Facebook, the Series A lead investor at Airbnb, and on and on. Reed is... Never heard of him. Never heard of him. <laughs> uh, but blitz scaling yeah. is, is a word that Reed and Chris came up with yeah. and what it really describes is the process that has been followed by many of the most iconic tech companies over the last 20 years to grow from nothing to massive value in a really short period of time by prioritizing speed over efficiency when you know that you're in a winner takes most market. Yeah, and how did you meet Chris? I met Chris, you know, it's interesting. Um, I was working, I was running the acceleration programs at ASU, this is 2014, and I had a lot of ideas about the things I wanted to work on, and I at some point realized that that wasn't gonna be possible in that environment, and so a switch went off in my mind um, I got to go do this on my own. And I walked out and got my car and drove home over my lunch break and picked up the phone and, and, and called Chris and said, I have an audacious proposal. I've got some things I, I want to do. Can we talk about how we might work together? Um, I had met one of his partners two years prior at a pitch contest here in Arizona. And so that's how I got to meet Chris. But you know, the conversation evolved. I eventually ended up moving on past um, ASU and, and we started um, a couple of businesses together. First of all, working with very early stage startups, kind of venture building and, and pre-seed investing. Um, secondly, running technology transfer and commercialization projects with yeah. the Department of Defense and, and overseas places like the Qatar Science and Technology Park. And so, you know, Chris and I were sort of the co-organizers and, and mentors of these programs. Um, along the way, he had the good fortune of being invited by Reed to become a co-author on these books. And so you could say as, you know, as Chris's fortunes have have shifted and there started to be intellectual property to work with, it made a lot of sense for us to incorporate that sure. and, and kind of double down on that. So blitz scaling has grown to become, you know, almost everything that I'm working on between the, the blitz scaling academy and blitz scaling ventures. Yeah, and blitz scaling, uh, the concept has not been around that long. It's a pretty rebellious idea when you think about how, you know, a new approaches to building companies. So I, I think it's very cool how you and Chris and Reed have brought together this this idea into a curriculum, into a cohort, into a community. Mm -hmm. Share a little bit about yeah. that process and how it's evolving. Well, so in, in fairness, Chris and Reed wrote the book and Chris would even be the one to say that really what it is is the encapsulation of Reed's company building and investment philosophy over the last 20 years. And it was prompted by him being asked a question at a panel discussion, I think in London mm -hmm. in around 2015, 
um, what is the secret of the success of Silicon Valley? And everybody in the audience would say things like, well, you know, there's Stanford and Berkeley, it's the best talent. Or there's Hewlett Packard and Stanford and uh, all these iconic companies, it's the best technology. Or they'd say, it's Sand Hill Road, it's all the VCs, you know, it's the money. And Reed found all of those answers to be unsatisfactory. And he said to Chris, why don't we write a book? Why don't we try to get to the bottom of the question of what really is it that's going on in Silicon Valley that has led to these outside results? And the answer turned out to be blitzscaling. It's the collective understanding between the entrepreneurs and the VCs that there are certain cases you got to know them when you see them. And you got to decide to bet on them when it makes sense to raise a ridiculous amount of money to scale at a pace that is unheard of and do all of these counterintuitive things. And, and this is something that other ecosystems haven't come yeah. to understand yet, probably just because they haven't had the learning curve. They haven't been there sure. yet. And that's what they call blitzscaling. And so it's prioritizing speed over efficiency in spite of uncertainty when you believe there's this enormous prize to win. Yeah. Um, and so my, my contribution to the lexicon has just been working with them. You know, I'm a big believer in application. So coming out of the accelerator in ACU, I, I still had this desire to help other entrepreneurs by taking concepts out of the book and turning them into, you know, study guides or canvases or things that, yeah. you know, translate what's in the book to something I can grasp in 10, in 10 minutes and sit around and talk about with my teammates and hopefully come up with some ideas that move me forward. So give the audience some ideas of these counterintuitive concepts. That I think, again, back to the concepts of rebels doing things differently, and mm -hmm. we'll come back to the heart piece in a little bit, but what are some of these counterintuitive concepts that set companies apart? Yeah, so they, they, they call them the, um, the counterintuitive rules, and they're particularly counterintuitive if, if you've been to business school or you know if you have an MBA or if you've ever worked in a, a large and well-managed company, which happened to be you know, my background. And so I, I can really speak to the fact that they're they're counterintuitive. They're, they're often things that you would need to unlearn something first mm -hmm. before you'd be comfortable applying them. So the, the first is, you know, just to embrace chaos. If, if you're in hyper growth, it, it is going to be crazy. Mm -hmm. Don't think it's going to stop tomorrow. It's not just you. It This is, this is the way it is. This is what it is. Um, number two, that you should launch a product that embarrasses you doesn't mean launch something terrible, doesn't mean launch something deceptive, you know, like in the case of, sure. uh, you know, uh, Theranos, or it, it doesn't mean be underhanded in any way. It just means get something out there. Let the users you tell, you, tell you what, um, what the product should be. And there's also other maxims like ignore your customers. Um, well, that may sound wrong because you're thinking, I can't ignore my customers, that's the success of my business, but it's really a question of knowing what to when, pay attention to and what not to. If you're still growing, if you're growing through hyper growth, then maybe you want to ignore nagging requests for new features or you know frequent complaints about something that you determine, you know what, I can fix that later. Mm -hmm. Once I've completed my period of hyper growth, once I've taken the hill and established market leadership, then I can come back and focus on efficiency I can put in place good management. I can do all of the things that I was taught to do in school or at, at the big company I worked at, just not now, because now I have to win. Yeah. If I don't win, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Because in a, in a blitz scaling market, I either win yes, or, you don't. or I lose. Right. And then all of those nice to have efficiencies that made me feel better as a, you know, um, a detail oriented person, they don't matter. Fascinating. So I'm going to kind of shift gears a little bit, because obviously you can talk about this concept and these teachings for quite some time. What motivates you? What motivates Jeff uh, about this heart concept? What's your purpose, and how are you infusing these two things together in your work in your life today? So you know, it's really interesting. Um, when I contrast myself with Chris, we, we describe Chris as a consummate Silicon Valley insider, and of course, so is Reed. They both went to Stanford and they spent their whole lives in Silicon Valley. What motivates me is how can I help people that don't have that natural advantage? Because I didn't. Um, I did not I. So. Right, I mean, and, and, and most people didn't. Most people are sitting on the outside looking in and saying, you know, what is the magic that's going on there? Um, I know that that was Reed's motivation in writing the book was to help as many people in as many places as possible learn the secrets and because he believes that you can blitz scale from anywhere. And 
So I've spent my life in places like, I grew up in a small town in Illinois. Um, I've lived in places like Louisville, Kentucky, Tucson, Arizona, Monterey, Mexico. Um, not the first places you would think of when you, when you think of blitz entrepreneurship scaling, yeah. or, or blitzscaling. And, um, and I know for a fact that people are just as smart there. There's certainly money in all those places. There's great universities and, and great technology. So I actually do agree with them that what was missing was an understanding of the strategy. Mm -hmm. And so what, what motivates me is, is to do something to, to bridge that, that gap, to, to provide some translation effect to help people no matter where they are. And that's, sure. that's really, in its essence, what the Blitzscaling Academy is designed to do is, yeah. is translate these ideas, create a, a global community, a, a conversation, so that people can get the help they need and, and talk to other people sharing sure. the same problems no matter where they are. So let's talk about that in the context of the last year. Obviously, now everyone is working all over the places. The, the, you know, the centers of influence around Silicon Valley, people are moving out of that area, they're moving mm -hmm. to new cities, they're moving abroad. You know, they're, they're, people are setting up shop all over the place. How is that changing your view, Chris's view? How is that changing the overall perspective and how you look the next 10 years in terms of incubating and building companies and finding entrepreneurs and you know, under, we well, wouldn't find them before, but really taking another level down. Well, it definitely reinforces the, the notion that technology enabled businesses are what's driving the economy, right? Sure. If you look at the performance of, of some of the top companies throughout the pandemic, many of them just not only sailed, but accelerated through it. Um, and so it, it also reinforces now if, if all of the best talent can choose to either co-locate or be wherever they want, that building a global company could happen anywhere, right? It's so faster. It, it kind of is disintermediating Silicon Valley to some degree by saying, maybe it isn't all about being here, it's about having the connectivity, having the smarts, access to talent, but it's not so much about the physical location anymore. And so um, how we're adapting to that is, well, we, we put our work online. So mm -hmm. we, we launched a virtual platform about, I guess it's been seven months now, I always say six months, but it's been seven. Um, you know, to try to find a way to work more flexibly with people no matter where they were. So that was definitely an innovation that came out of the, the pandemic for us. And number two, um, on the Blitzscaling Ventures side, we just brought in a whole group of, we call them fellows, but they're really interns or analysts in about 20 different markets around the world to bring uh, local insight and context um, to deals that are getting done in different parts of the world. So. We're, we're looking at Crunchbase and PitchBook. We're looking for blitz scalable companies, uh, but now we're looking globally. Yeah. Not Are you just finding companies in surprising locations right now? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and what's more interesting than the individual companies is the trends you start to, to spot. Um, for example, there's a lot of commonality between things that are going on in Brazil and Indonesia mm -hmm. in terms of business model design and the way they're applying technology. We think, wow, these are both very large 200 million plus population markets. There's a large base of the pyramid. There's a lot of unmet needs like banking or um, overpriced food or you know access to healthcare. A lot of basic needs that technology entrepreneurs are finding um, creative new ways to solve. And so that, th that's some of the most interesting takeaways that I've had in the last six months. That is interesting. And are you seeing those entrepreneurs coming locally from those countries? Or are you finding that they're Silicon Valley and other you know, expats that are moving there and building there and, and that's pretty fascinating so in, in almost all cases they're they're local but that's if cool. you dig a level deeper most of them have had some kind of experience at, at one of the top tech companies like they've either studied in the u.s or done a stint at, at a tech company or maybe they worked at the google or facebook or amazon branch in their in their local market there's there's almost always that connection are there any other connections in terms of the personality types of these people that are driving them to push through new models for um, I, I think you can definitely see too um, the influence of education. Um, many of them, when you dive through their, their LinkedIn profiles, you can see that they um, were educated in the US or, or mm -hmm. another more advanced economy. And, and so clearly, you know, they're translating things that they've seen and bringing it back, but but modifying it to, to meet the needs of, of the local market. So there's definitely, um, you know, dissemination taking place of ideas and technology and education um, and, and experience working at, at big tech companies that, that I would say are common elements, or they're, they're, all, they're probably common elements that you should look for. 
if you were to compare two or three teams doing something similar in a market, probably I would favor the team that had more of those kinds of experiences than less. Sure, got it. And as you think now, a couple of years out, the integration of Blitzscaling Academy with Blitzscaling Ventures, how is that evolving around this concept of education and really mm -hmm. creating these markets? So the two businesses are absolutely separate. Um, same, same people working on them. Um, the fund is very focused on a very particular kind of company, which is a needle in a haystack. So on the fund side, we're scanning the portfolios of the top Series A investors, mm -hmm. about 35 to 50 firms, and we're adding in top tier local Series A investors as we get to know them in places like Stockholm or Singapore. But we're pretty much looking at, you know, only those deals that have passed due diligence by a Sequoia, an Excel, uh, Lightspeed, et cetera. And then we're scoring them with our blitzscaling framework and saying, you know, we think these are the most scalable of all, of all the portfolios of these best investors. Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, we're trying to build a relationship and invest. When we get the chance to invest, it's because we promise to add value. And the value we're adding is to work as advisors and, you know, consultants to help them think through how to apply wood scaling in their company. So it's almost like promising the value add, promising the strategic advisory, instead of making them pay for it, giving us the right to invest because we, we really believe in their potential. The Blitzscaling Academy is a support to that. It, the, the platform helps us as a place to store the custom work that we do for them, maybe a place to have a private dialogue with, with some of the top execs in our portfolio companies, but was really designed to serve a different audience, which is people who aspire to scale or, or learn how to apply blitz scale, whether or not we end up investing in them. Mm -hmm. And so there, um, really what we're trying to do is, is you know translate and make it self-serve as much as possible. Um, how do I diagnose my scaling strengths and weaknesses? How do I think about how to apply blitz scaling? How do I do as much of this on my own as possible so that I can show up with good questions? Mm -hmm. um, and hopefully, I mean, it's certainly my hope, I think there's a third opportunity that isn't there yet, and that's to put some kind of a pre-seed or seed fund mm -hmm. that sits and looks at the academy. And, and so the very same process of deal flow generation that we follow for the Series B investments, we can start talking to people at seed stage and say, hey, come join us in the academy, um, work with them in a more scalable fashion, and maybe place an investment a little earlier um, in the hope that they migrate to the fund. Makes right. sense. One thing at a time. <laughs> Very cool. So for entrepreneurs, for investors, LPs, anyone who wants to learn more about the work you're doing, where can they find out about Blitzscaling Ventures and Blitzscaling Academy? So Blitzscaling Ventures, the website is blitzscalingvc.com and the academy is blitzscalingacademy.com. Um, you'll see my smiling face along with Chris Yeh and our partner Scott Johnson um, at Blitzscaling Ventures. Um, on the fund website, there's really helpful newsletters and podcasts where we go through and look at some of the best deals that are coming through today and, and talk about them in the context of, of blitzscaling, why we like them or why we don't. So it really helps gain insight into, into you know how to look at some of these businesses. And on the academy side, there's an executive summary, there's a canvas, there's a number of videos that are free and easy to use for anybody that, that wants to check them out. Awesome. Well, Jeff, really appreciate you spending some time with us today, sharing a little bit about your work, and, and it's exciting, obviously, and looking forward to following up the progress you all make and wishing you more success with it. Thank you, and it's been great uh, learning about you and what you're doing with Life Guides.